to allow me. All right. Uh, uh, good good afternoon. And uh, well, for those who'll be watching it in, a, in the morning or in the in the evening. Good evening. Hello, everybody. We're going to uh, start with our Bible study for today. Uh, this is study number six. And if you'd like to see the other studies, they're on the TESDA uh, YouTube page, uh, study number one to number five. And I'm going to hand over to our host, please. Feel free to write in the chat your questions, but at the same time, there's always an opportunity for us to discuss. Uh, welcome to you, Elder C. Uh, Uncle Da, let me hand over to you because now it's 16.10. Thank you very much. And I'm going to switch off my video. Thank you and welcome to everyone. So we'll start off by sharing the screen. And today we're going to have a short session because um, we're talking about chiasms and we have actually chatted about it as add-ons to two of our last sessions. So there's not much that will be new. So what we'll be doing is we'll be just formalizing the fact that we've gone over chiasms as a session. And we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel today for our chiasms. And we'll start off by just going over the reason we are. So we, we are going to be studying the book of Revelation and before we start the study of the book of Revelation, we're looking at tools that we'll be using to study. And those tools are essentially patterns that are in the Bible. So we'll be using cycles, which look at um, the pattern of cycles throughout the whole Bible. We'll be looking at time sections, and that looks at time sections throughout the whole Bible. And then we're going to be looking at chiasms. And with chiasms, we'll be looking at patterns within the book of Revelation, as well as within sections and chapters of the book of Revelation to help us get a better understanding. And then after that, the last pattern that we'll be using is the sanctuary. So the pattern of the sanctuary is what we'll look at at the next session that we have in January, where we look at how the book of Revelation is written in the form of the sanctuary, because without that fundamental understanding, I don't think we can get a full understanding of the book of Revelation. So the sanctuary pattern is what we'll look at in our next session. And then of course, we'll be looking for help from other authors and books so that we can stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before us in the understanding of the book of Revelation. So we're going to start off by looking at um, a trip that Brother Bushe took to the mountaintop. And the last session we had, I made the story up, but what I'd like is for us to hear it from the horse's mouth today, where he talks about right from the beginning when he was at the bottom of the mountain, right up to when he's got the picture on point E, when he's on the top of the mountain, and he's going to tell us about point B, point C, and point B, which are three things that he saw as he went up the mountain. And I don't know if we could get him to share his um, picture so we can all see the picture as he talks. Who's good with technology? Who can help with that? Is that possible or not? If we pin him, he'll be the main picture, right? Yeah. Yeah, he'll be the main picture. I'm just thinking though, Uncle Da, if someone is joining uh, us online and starts with study number six, would you kindly maybe give an overview or is it something that you will uh, uh, explain as after Smulhe has told us his story? That's right. So I'll explain it after his story. I'll go okay. over it. All right. Okay, then. Thank you. Well, thank you, Uncle Da, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, maybe I should switch off the video, then the picture would be showing on the screen, right? Okay. Yeah. Right, so thank you for the opportunity and uh, the ambush. <laughs> Sister viewer is right, I tried to, I had, a, I, had a, I had a better idea, but you know, she can be stubborn sometimes. So, so, I mean, this, um, this peak was taken up on the Silver Mine Nature Reserve 
in Cape Town, just on the cliffs of the Constantia Beck Mountains. Um, it's overlooking Constantia uh, and uh, Tokai, you know, um, and Fishwook. No, not Fishwook, uh, Tokai side of, 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 of the mountain. Um, it was on the 31st of December. Um, we love hiking. We, we love hiking and Cape Town offers a lot of hiking spots and, and hiking trails. And so this one uh, end of the year, we decided to, to do Silver Mine. And, and Silver Mine was chosen because it's one of the simpler hiking trails. You know, we had done Table Mountain and it's hectic. You can, you can do Lion's Head, it's quick and short, but it can be very, very hectic as well. So this time we, want, we wanted something easy, something you know, that everybody could do at a short space of time, but you know, yet offers the exercise, but also those breathtaking views. And so we tried Silver Mine uh, Nature Reserve. It is part of the Table Mountain uh, Nature Reserve as it is. And so you drive in, um, from you, you could come from the Tokai side of things or from uh, North Wook. Either way, you'll have to use Okap Sever. When I say Okap Sever, I know a sister, um, your, your elder there, Uncle Da, and um, elder viewer. Uh, we once ran Two Oceans Marathon. And that year, they changed the route and they rerouted into Okap Sever. Now, Okap Sever is a killer of a mountain. It's an incline that keeps going and going and going and going and going and it never ends and it kills you dead, 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 dead. You know, like Kumshaya Zafi type of a thing. Um, so you drive in, you know, off Okap Sever into the into Silver Mine um, a forest. You would park in the parking lot. It's well demarcated, a good park. And as you get off, I think the first thing uh, Uncle Da wanted to mention, of course, you know, I was with my kids, uh, the whole family and, 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 and other family friends we had visited. So I take stock of everyone who was there and would do give a brief, you know, this part of the mountain um, has a lot of baboons. Um, if you've been to Cape Point, you know the struggle with the baboons. In, in fact, people who live in Tokai, you know, are constantly fighting the baboons every day. And so in this mountain or this part of the mountain, you nonetheless or inevitably will, um, you may encounter baboons. And so, you know, there's some house rules we have to go through, you know, give them ways of how to protect themselves and what to do if they come across baboons would want to steal, you know, the backpacks or whatever bags or snacks, whatever else you're having. So, so and then we take off. Um, and walk, uh, but the first point you see and the first thing you observe, which is now, you know, point B, and it's not very far from point A, is a small dam, small, uh, it's actually a reservoir, um, but it's quite neat, tranquil, like quiet, all green all around it. And you can walk around the dam because of course there's a walking trail. So they've done a nice walk around the dam in a very short space of time. And there's people, you know, every now and then you'd find people who actually dip in and swim across or, or play around, you know, near the shores of this dam. It's not a big dam. And so that's the first point is water. And you could think, you know, water, spring of life, water of life. Um, if you thirst, if you drink of this water, you will not thirst anymore. Or, you know, you know what I mean? And then you walk. Now, this is a nature reserve and it's, it is a conservative, a conserve, what's the right word? Yeah, for, for fainbos. And Cape Town is famous for the fainbos uh, vegetation, which is beautiful in season and it can flower and bloom and all sorts of colors. Uh, throughout the year, you get different things, which is actually one thing that's nice about hiking anywhere in Cape Town. It can be dry this time of the year, but you would find something, <clears throat> something that's really doing well and that's in flower or flowering and beautiful. And so you would observe the fainbos, you know, in its variety and, and the beauty that comes with it. Um, that's perhaps another observation. Are we in point C now? And, and this will take us through the gruesome walk, not very hard, but nonetheless, it's a hike. 
it will take us through the gruesome walk, the ups and the downs uh, as we look around. And as we get onto um, almost the top, not really the top, you then have these breathtaking views of the, almost the entire Cape Town. If you look across, as you can see in the picture, uh, I'm looking across, you can see a mountain range, which is that other side of Stellenbosch or the False Bay side of, uh, of Cape Town. And, and that is the Hottentots Mountains. And, and so before you get here, you will just get on this small hill. And these are the views you can see right across and you can look to your left, would be towards Cape Town. And if you look across beyond Cape Town is False Bay. And beyond False Bay or right in the middle of False Bay is Robben Island. Very important observation because we'll tie it together with what I'm looking at as I'm standing uh, right at the door of that cave. And so this breathtaking views of Cape Town, you know, as flat as it is, and this is where you see how flat Cape Town is. Um, and how Cape Town, how vulnerable Cape Town is from any small sea level rise because then False Bay and Table Bay can easily link up and the whole of Cape Town is underwater. So that's the views you see. And so we continue with the gruesome hike. We walking up, some tiredness, watering, spot, uh, watering stops um, and you know, some fruits, banana here, here and there to recharge. And, and as we, start ascending towards the cave, there's a, a, a nice small um, ruin, which just sits on a hill and very nice. As I've got a nice picture of it, just looking from this side of the cave and looking towards it and it just stands out, but it's a ruin and, and they've kept it nicely there. I forgot what the name of it, uh, I forgot what it's called. And then from that point onwards, it's just a gentle incline. Um, but of course you're tired. Uh, if you're unfit, you are feeling it as you climb here and then you are facing the cliffs of uh, the table of, of this part of Constantia Berg. And, and those cliffs are made of the Table Mountain sandstone. It's a rock, beautiful rock uh, called the sandstone. And as an earth scientist or a, earth scientist or a geologist, you know, obviously rocks are my thing. I'm looking at this rock and you start imagining, you know, revelation um, uh, 22, the last chapter of, Re of Revelation, when we approach that beautiful city, chapter 21 and chapter 22, when we approach the city and, 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 you know, when the Bible talks about the foundations, the top foundations of the city, it talks about the different minerals or the different stones that make the foundation, the amethyst, the, the, the jasper, you know, um, and, and it lists all of them, the jasin, uh, all 12 of them. And then when you approach the gates, the gates are made of pearls. And again, when I'm looking at this cliff, you know, I can think of, you know, the foundation and the walls that make the city, the new city, the holy city. And this is what you see when you approach the cave, the cave. before you even see, you know, the door, the cave, uh, the cave itself, you're just looking at these cliffs and almost like, you know, sliced by a knife, very cold. Um, cliffs of, 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 of sandstone or Table Mountain sandstone, sandstone as we know it. And, and then you eventually get into some dusty, you know, loose gravelly and, and, and off, then boom, you are in, in the mouth of the cave. And, and, um, and, and that's, the, that's the climax of the trip, but it doesn't end there. Before you climax, the real climax, we've got this cave and so you can get in the cave and, and observe the cave. It's, it's almost like an, a small amphitheater. And, but looking, you know, as I'm standing there on a rock right in the middle of the cave and looking out towards, again, the greater Cape Town, you're looking uh, at Tokai and looking at Paulsmore Prison. Um, the Paulsmore Prison is obviously a, a prison that's still a prison but the significance of it in our history is that Mandela spent some time in Polsma prison. And as you are looking at Polsma prison, beyond Polsma prison is Cape Town and Signal Hill. And beyond Signal Hill, you could almost just make or think about what lies beyond, which is Robben Island, where Mandela and uh, Nelson Mandela, the former president of South Africa, spent the majority of, the, of, um, of his incarceration. And so that gesture and that symbol doesn't only symbolize, you know, the joy that comes with climaxing a mountain or a hike. It also symbolizes the freedom we now enjoy 
from those dark days of apartheid when we are locked in and couldn't get to these beautiful places and beautiful hikes just because we were black. So that is the story about the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was lovely, lovely, lovely. So we'll just get back now to our sharing. So the story that we have just heard from Brother Bushe, that lovely story, was about the trip right from the bottom of the mountain and how they came up and there was a story about the dam and then they came up further and we heard about the beautiful flowers and then we came up some more, they came up some more and we heard about all the, the beautiful view of all the different parts they could see, including the Hottentot mountain and then the different geology that was there and then the climax at the cave whereby the cave where the picture was taken and all the different things that could be seen and the things that could be imagined beyond what he could see. So that was where the climax was. And that's the, the typical story that we tell nowadays. When we are telling someone about something that we've done, that's how it goes and it stops at the climax. But what the old Hebrews who wrote the Bible used to do is that they would tell that story, but also tell the story of going back down the mountain after reaching the climax. So if Brother Wuchle was an old time Hebrew, he would have then told us about after taking the picture at the mouth of the cave, he then went down and he saw that geology again that reminded him of Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the Hottentot mountains. And then as they went down again, the views that they saw of the whole Cape Town and other mountains. And then as they went down again further, the nice flowers they saw. And then as they went down again to point B, the dam and the people who were swimming and the different things in the dam. And then back to point A where the cars were parked and the baboons were. So this is um, a story that is chiasmic in structure in that if you put a mirror through point E, which is the right at the climax, there's a reflection of what you said when you were going up and it reflects on the other side. So that's essentially what a chiasm is. It's a structure, a sentence structure, which is structured that way. And when we are reading about it, we usually draw the chiasm sitting on its side like this, where you read a verse in point A1, and then another verse, point B1, and then another one, C1, and then D1. And then you then read another verse, D2, and you'll find that D1 and D2 have a same theme or similar theme. And then you go to C2, and that is a similar theme to the verse you read up there on C1. And then you continue reading, and B2 will have a similar theme to what you read in B1. And as you reach the end of your reading, the last verse will have a similar theme to the first verse you read. So that's what the chiasmic structure looks like when you are reading the Bible. And an example of that is when you look at um, reading a book that will talk about fingers and it will, let's say, tell you about that the fingers were long. And then it will talk about the palms, the arms, the shoulder, and then the rib cage, and then it will apex with the up to head and down to the heart. So that is the apex. And if you notice, this one has a single apex, whereas the A, B, C, D we had had a double apex. And then from the apex, you continue reading rib cage, shoulder, arm, palm, and fingers. And sorry. And what you may find is that this time when it talks about the fingers, it talks about the fingernails and not about how long the finger was. So if you find that there's a difference, the theme is the same, it's all fingers, but then that difference about the first part being how long the fingers are, and at the end, the nails on the fingers, that contrast itself will have something to teach us. So as we read chiasms in, Bible, in the Bible, we note the main theme, and then we note the differences, and we note the apex. And then all of those attributes 
will have something to teach us about what we are reading about. So chiasms, essentially, when we are studying the Bible now, what we are doing is we're saying that, okay, what does God want us not to miss? What lesson does he want us not to miss in this particular section of the Bible that I am reading? So I am not reading it and saying, what do I understand? What do I gain from reading what I'm reading? But I'm saying, okay, passively, what does God want me not to miss in the way he structured this passage of the Bible? And the other thing to note is that sometimes they're not perfectly symmetrical, but they're a little lopsided. They can involve words, they can involve different themes, verbs, so that your chiasm is based on verbs and words and not just themes. So you find that it's the same story, but it's told twice and in parallel. And the variances between the points are the ones to note um, as the, the ones that will teach you the most. And they can be single, arrow-headed or double-centered. And you find chiasms by just Googling um, chiasm in whatever book you want to look at and you'll see what other people have found. Or you can look, at, look for them yourself by going to the Bible and looking for symmetry and chiasms. So right at the beginning, we spoke about the two books of prophecy for our time, our generation being the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, as well as a few chapters and verses like Matthew chapter 24 and throughout the New Testament, there are other verses and sections that are relevant to prophecy to our generation, but the main books being Daniel from the Old Testament and Revelation in the New Testament. So as we study the book of Revelation, we're going to be looking at chiasms within the book of Revelation. So what I thought is that for today, let's look at the other book of prophecy for our generation, which is a book of Daniel and see what chiasms we can find in the book of Daniel. So to start us off, we will look at the whole book of Daniel. And what you find is that chapter one talks about Daniel and his friends being exiled into Babylon. So they're coming from Canaan and they're going into Babylon. Then as you read on in chapter two to chapter four, you find it talks about the statue with the kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and then God's kingdom. So that's what you then find in those other chapters. If you go to chapter three, you find the three Hebrew boys who are delivered from the fiery furnace. And then if you go to chapter four, you read the story of King Nebuchadnezzar who had a dream about a big tree, which was providing shade for different kinds of animals, birds nesting in it. And then that tree was chopped down. And then as you read the story, Daniel then comes to explain that vision to King Nebuchadnezzar. And he tells King Nebuchadnezzar that the tree is you, O king. And so you will be chopped down. And so Nebuchadnezzar, when it actually happened, he was mad for seven years. And then he came to his senses again. If you go to chapter five, that's also about a different king of Babylon who was humbled. And that was King Belshazzar. And chapter five will talk about how he was having a party and a feast, um, drinking wine and making merry, and a hand comes and writes on the wall, and he dies um, before that party is over. So that's a different king of Babylon who was humbled. If you read chapter six of Daniel, that talks about Daniel in the lion's den and his deliverance. So what you find is that here we've got a double apex, chapter four and chapter five about kings being humbled, then when we go on to Daniel chapter six, we're back to deliverance, which ties in with chapter three, which we saw up here, which was deliverance from a fiery furnace. So here we've got the theme of deliverance, but different people being delivered. Then if you go to chapter seven to chapter nine of the book of Daniel, it then talks about the worldly kingdoms again. But in chapter seven, we're now seeing different beasts rising out of the sea, but again, we're looking at kingdoms of the world coming up again. We're looking at the same kingdoms that we saw in chapter two, and then God's kingdom being established again. And then if you go to Daniel chapter 10 to chapter 12, what you're looking at here is exiles returning to Canaan. 
And this time it's the heavenly Canaan that is spoken about in Daniel chapter 12. So you find that the whole book of Daniel is actually written as a chiasm. So going back to our principles of the chiasm, the center is what God wants, to, wants us to focus on, which is the humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar and the humbling of King Belshazzar, both who are kings of Babylon. So if we look deeper into the double apex that we have in chapter four, when you look at Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was represented as the tree, that tree was chopped down. And in reality, what happened was that he went mad and he was eating grass and his hair became unkempt and he'd wake up on the fields with the dew on him. And then there was a day when he then looked up to heaven. And when he looked up to heaven, he repented and recognized God. And then his kingdom was restored. So I'd like us to read just that one verse, um, which is Daniel chapter 4, verse 34. So that essentially captures what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. And I will read it. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. So he lifted his eyes to heaven and he recognized God and his madness went away and he became sane, sane again. And I blessed the most high and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So his kingdom is then restored. So we have a king who was humbled by God. He repented and his kingdom is restored. And then we go to chapter five, where we look at Belshazzar. And Belshazzar was a very arrogant and proud king. And he threw a party. And when he had been drinking a lot, he then gave orders that the um, things that had been taken from God's temple in Jerusalem, when the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem, all the gold cups and things from the temple should be brought to the party so that they could drink from those very things to show that they have power over the Jews and the God of the Jews. So we'll read just two verses from there. And that's first chapter five, verses three and four. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. So essentially they were telling the true God that we don't care about you. Look, we have conquered you. We will use your things to praise our gods. And then if you read further, you'll then read about how the hand that wrote on the wall and it said that, you have been found wanting and your kingdom will be taken from you. And on that very day, he lost his life and he lost his kingdom to Cyrus who was from the Medo Persian side of things. So you've got a King Nebuchadnezzar who was proud. He was humbled by God. He repented. His kingdom was restored. And then chapter five, a second King Belshazzar, who was proud. He was unrepentant. His kingdom was taken from him and he lost his life. So the central message that God is telling us here is that we have two choices. We have a choice that we are where we are, but if we are humble and we repent, we will be restored to God's kingdom and he will take care of us. But if we are proud and unrepentant, we will lose both our lives and we will lose the kingdom. So this is a not to miss message that God has us in the book of Daniel. So that's the chiasm of the book of Daniel with the main message. Now let's look at a different type of chiasm, a second, um, more chiasms in the book of Daniel. So the book of Daniel is written in two languages. It's written in Aramaic, and then it's also written in Hebrew. So the initial part is Aramaic, and that's from chapter two to chapter seven. And chapter 8 to chapter 12 is written in Hebrew. Semitic languages, so both of those are Semitic languages. And the word Semitic is derived from one of Noah's sons, 
Shem. So Noah had his three sons, and then God decided that Christ would be born from um, the line of Shem. So those then became known as the Semites. So the Semitic languages are very similar. Examples of other ceramic Semitic languages are the Semitic people are the Edomites and the Moabites. And then if I can just um, withdraw one thing there. So Aramaic, I would need to go back and look to see if that's also a Semitic language. But then Aramaic was the main language of Babylon. And then the Babylonians, their official language of communication was Aramaic. So the book of Daniel was written in Babylon. So it was written in Aramaic, symbolizing that it was that that part was written so that the Babylonians could easily understand, the Gentiles could easily understand. So that's chapter two to chapter seven of the book of Daniel. Whereas chapter eight to 12 was written in Hebrew. So that part would have been easier for the Israelites, the Jews to actually understand. So because of those differences, what has been suggested is that the Aramaic section was written primarily for the Gentiles, and then the Hebrew section was written primarily for the Jews in captivity at that stage. So let's look at the Aramaic part, which is Daniel chapter two to chapter seven, which was written primarily for the Gentiles. So what you'll find is that that section of Daniel is written also as a chiasm. So from chapter two to chapter four, it's the kingdoms, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. So that's what you find in those chapters. Daniel chapter three is the trial that the three Hebrew boys went through when they were cast into the fiery furnace and they proved to be faithful. Daniel chapter four is about a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, who repented. Daniel chapter five is about a pagan king, Belshazzar, who was unrepentant. So in the previous section, we had looked at it as a double um, arrow and we had then looked at the meaning of that double arrow. But if we now zero down on it and we're looking only at the Aramaic, so you've got chapter four being King Nebuchadnezzar, him repenting, chapter five being Belshazzar, non-repentant. And the middle of that is actually where the arrowhead is, which is Daniel chapter four, verse 37. So I will read that particular verse, which is right in the middle. So that reads, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, Praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he will put, he is able to put down. So here we are seeing that the arrow or the apex of the Aramaic is talking about the character of God, that his works are truth and his ways are justice, and he puts down the proud. So that essentially is the apex of this section. And then as we go further, so on the coming downside, chapter five, Belshazzar, chapter six, another trial, Daniel and the lion's den and him being faithful. Chapter seven, we then see the four kingdoms, but this time represented as the beast that comes out of the sea. But again, it's the same kingdoms where you've got um, Babylon, you've got Greece, you've got Medo-Persia, Greece, and you've got Rome in those kingdoms but this time represented differently as beasts. So that's the center of chiasm number one, which is written in the Aramaic. Interesting thing is that if you actually look at it in time sequence or chronologically, chapter five talks about Babylon coming to an end and Belshazzar the king is killed and the Medes and the Persians come and they take over power. Chapter six talks about Daniel in the lion's den and Darius was king at that stage, and Darius was king of the Medes and the Persians. Chapter seven starts off by saying in the first year of Belshazzar. And so chapter seven is actually taking us back to Babylon. The king who died in chapter five is now being spoken of again in chapter seven. And then you ask yourself, but hang on, why didn't God just make the book of Daniel in a time sequence or chronologically correct. 
But if God had done that, there would not have been any chiasms in the book of Daniel. So what you find is that God actually decided that let's make this, let's put chapter seven out of sequence and put it after chapter six, when we've already moved into the Medes and the Persians. And that way there'll be a perfect chiasm. And I, people who study using chiasms can then actually see what is a not to miss message. So again, showing how the Bible is an inspired book, and I don't know how people can actually look at it and say, this is just written by man, and it's just someone who put everything together. Because when you look at how everything falls into place just naturally, you then get an understanding of what God is talking about when he says that we should search the Bible, and in it we will find treasures and gems. So that is just a side note. So let's look at the second chiasm. Book of Daniel, as it is written in the Hebrew language, which is chapter 8 to chapter 12. So chapter 8 talks about the details of the kingdoms, but then this time the kingdom of Babylon is removed and it talks about he goats and rams and things like that. But essentially chapter 8 details the kingdoms without the kingdom of Babylon. Chapter 9 from verse 1 to 23, it's... Daniel praying for the deliverance of his people after he had misunderstood something. And then Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 25 is the center of this particular chiasm, and it's a double apex here. So chapter 9, 24 to 25 talks about the arrival and the purpose of the Messiah. Then chapter 9 verses 26 and 27 talks about not the arrival, but this time the death of the Messiah and how he will be cut off or crucified. So it's all about the Messiah, one talking about his birth and arrival and his purpose, then the second part, the Messiah, his death and his crucifixion. So his departure rather than his arrival. So a note here that is that both talk about the Messiah, but different aspects, one about the arrival, one about his death, and remember when we gave the example of the finger that one may talk about how long it is what, and the other part may talk about the nail on the finger and that the differences are what we should note because they are where we should focus on and compare. So one, the arrival and the second one, the departure or the death and crucifixion of Christ. Then if you go to Daniel chapter 10, that again is another prayer of Daniel where he, he prays again about the deliverance of God's people. And then Daniel chapter 11 to 12 is again talking about the kingdoms, the same kingdoms that are in chapter 8, Rome, Greece, Medo-Persia. So again, we go back to the kingdoms. So here we're looking at a chiasm, double chiasm in chapter 9 with those particular things. So the emphasis here being that um, the emphasis for this being that most important thing for the Hebrews is that they should know that there is a deliverer who is coming and that deliverer is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, that he is going to be crucified, that he will die for them. So that was the main focus for the Jews in what the chiasm were telling them. So let's put it all together, those chiasms we've looked at, essentially tell us that everyone has a choice. And if you look at the Gentile section, even the Gentiles, God looks at them and they have a choice that if they turn to God, they will be brought into God's kingdom, even though they are Gentiles. But if they choose their own self-pleasing ways, they will lose that promised kingdom and they will also lose their lives. And if you look at the Hebrew section, that tells us how that will be achieved. So God tells the Hebrews that there is a Messiah who will come. And if you tie that in with what we, we read in the Aramaic section, and you put the whole story together, the first section of the whole book, and then the sec second section of the two different chiasms of Aramaic and Hebrew, what the book of Daniel tells us is that the character of God, he's a God of truth, and the God of justice. So if God tells you that if you sin, you will be lost because the wages of sin is death, that you can trust that to be true because he's a God of justice 
and his law cannot change. But then you are then told that he's also a God of mercy because there's going to be a Messiah who will come, who will be crucified for us and for our sins. So he is not only a God of truth and justice, but he is also a God of mercy. So these are all things that God is saying, do not miss when you study the book of Daniel. Now, when we study the book of Daniel, we may read it and say that the book of Daniel is about statues that stand for kingdoms. It's about beasts. It's about horns. But we may actually miss that central message, which God says that the message not to miss when you study the book of Daniel is my character. I am a God of truth. I am a God of justice, but I am also a God of mercy. And you have a choice. If you choose to repent from your ways and choose me, you will have eternal life and you will inherit a kingdom. If you choose to be self-pleasing and not to turn to me, you will lose your life and you will lose the kingdom. So essentially, this is the central message that we should not miss from the book of Daniel, where God is telling us that this is what I want you to see from the book of Daniel. So let's just pile on cycles onto what we've been studying from the book of Daniel. So if we look at cycles and what we've been looking at right now in the book of Daniel, we can go back to Adam and Eve, where the same choice was given that obey God and stay in Eden, the kingdom, or disobey God and lose Eden or lose the kingdom. And that's essentially what happened. Adam and Eve chose to disobey. And they lost Eden and they lost that as a kingdom. If you look at Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, it was the same um, story that was given that submit to God and you will be returned to the kingdom. And which was the same offer which was then given to Adam and Eve after they had lost Eden and lost the kingdom that submit to God and you will be returned. Refuse to submit and refuse to repent and you will lose your life eternally and lose the kingdom. So essentially the same thing that was offered to Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar is the same thing that was offered to Adam and Eve. And if you look at us today, we are also in exactly the same situation where we have the same offer, where submit to God, repent of your sins wherever you are, and you will be given the kingdom, heaven, and you will be given eternal life, and refuse to repent, and you will lose your life, and you will lose heaven, you will lose that eternal kingdom. So essentially, you find that We've got the same story throughout the Bible, and that's a story of our salvation and the story of our redemption, where we are told that we have a choice and it's up to us to choose life or to choose death. And we are shown the character of God in that story, that God is a God who loves us and a God who wants to save us. So it's exactly the same story. And the reason why we focused on Daniel today is that when we get to the book of Revelation and we're studying the book of Revelation, that we must keep this main story in mind, that when we're studying Revelation, the main story there will not be the beasts and the different um, things that we see, which are scary and frightening, but essentially the story of redemption and the story that reveals God's character and God's love is what we should focus on. So this is where we end today. And the floor is now open for discussion and comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, much appreciated, Uncle Da. Um, we're now going to have the time for either if you want to make to, to comment or to ask questions. Uh, please feel free to do so. There's there's no right or wrong question or even an aha. I think, would you kindly go to your slides, Uncle Dai, and project again, the one where you have the chiasm for the entire for the entire book of, of Daniel. Actually, oh. I think that was quite enlightening. I also want to thank Bulche uh, for, for his story, for sharing that story when we started. Uh, the one where you have the entire book. Yes, yes, the... It's, it's funny, even before you had explained that humbling of King Nebuchadnezzar and also what happened? Have you got load shedding in Canada, Uncle Dan? 
Um, I don't know. Let me try it again. I don't know what happened to it. Oh, it jumps to a different screen. Yeah. But, but I guess the, 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 the main point was in chapter four, where you have the humbling of uh, King Nebuchadnezzar and then chapter five, Belshazzar. But at the same time, you always, throughout history, you always get a, good, a, a different response from different people. It's either we come to repentance or come to rebellion. Okay, beautiful people. Let's see the hands as I point at different people who would like to... It's, it's, it's wonderful to see you, Elder Tladi. Elder Tladi didn't have electricity uh, for three weeks. How long was it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, to... it was two weeks. It was two weeks. Oh, my goodness. Did you learn to make fire outside? <laughs> uh, we, we stuck with the gas. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, Madiba, it's 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 also wonderful to see you back. We had Mandlovu last time when you went for the Iron Man. Uh, was it that weekend? Maybe not. Okay, then anyone, Elder C uh, comments. It's also great to see you, uh, Chris as well. Anyone who would like to make a, a contribution to the study we've had so far? Mm. Don't pretend to be shy, guys. Okay, Matiba, over to you, sir. Oh, Mantlo. Greetings, everyone. Just a question. Uh, this is very deep and and detailed and analytically. Just for simplification of it, what does this chiasm tell us about God? grace to us as sinners, God's love and God's uh, plan of redemption. I just want to summarize it in that. I, I, I got it, but I just want to package it as I memorize it and engrave it in my mind. Uh, thank you, Peduma. Um, Uncle Da would want to respond. At any, anyone oh, else that matters? Everyone. Yes, so if I can just open it to everyone, because I think that um, can be answered. And because I'd also like to benefit from what others saw. Okay, all right. Uh, Elder C? Okay, Matiba, I see your, your microphone is, 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 is on as well. Okay, yes, I, I wanted to say there's something I... I'm, I'm picking up in this whole chasm, but I just want to, to explain it to me. I don't want to go out with a wrong interpretation of this, given that he has digested this earlier than I don't want my excitement to lead me to something else, which is not. That's why I'm asking that question. Okay. You know, Madiba, actually, it would have been so, so nice for you to say, hey, this is this is what I'm seeing. Okay, I see Chris's hand is up. Chris, over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Oh, thanks for the for the lovely study. Um, I think for me, um, the, the chiasm uh, speaks a lot to how deliberate God is in communicating to us. Um, how well thought out his plans are for humanity and for us as individuals. And as, as I look at the, the structure of the chasms and the messages that we can extract from them, I'm just impressed with how um, organized and planned and deliberate and thoughtful and careful God is towards us as his, his people. That's, that's the message that I get, you know, that, that God is intentional. Um, about me and and um, I ought to sit down and, and reflect on that and respond to that love and intentionality and care and detail in his approach. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Chris, uh, because you're, you're right. I mean, God could have still communicated uh, his love for us, his, his story of salvation. But when you see the pattern, the, the, the cycles, the poetry, the beauty of that, you can see that this is really well thought out. Uh, I'm going, I've got, we've got two names. Uh, 
uh, Prof. Uh, Elder Namo and then uh, Nyasha will follow. Um, um, I'm, I'm assuming that is the Nyasha from Canada. I also see my friend Seshi here. Welcome Seshi as well to our Bible study. Uh, Namo, a family, over to you. Thank you. I, I think that Nyasha should be from Zimbabwe, via Canada. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, the interesting part um, uh, of uh, what I'm getting is special for from today's study uh, 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 led by Brother Dewa. Um, there were many points that I picked, but the first one really is this idea of removing the scary part in the story of the horns and the beast and everything, which, which, which basically has become one of the central messages in our church. And we are seeing the, the, the fact that the central message I mean, is not about the horns or maybe the beast and the, the bronze. There, there is a central message there around you repent, you get saved, you don't repent, you get doomed. But I think the other issue that touched me today is the double chiasm. Remember, we started with the chiasm uh, of the whole book. The Hindu was now divided into Arabic for the Jews, at one for, for, for the Jews, um, um, uh, um, American, I don't know what writing was that, and <laughs> one for, 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 for Hebrews. So it did mean that the, the second split also meant a lot of sense, uh, two to seven and also eight to, to 12. But I think the overall picture that was kept in terms of also uh, bringing the circles on top, uh, uh, to me really like, like it was a killer. And, and now maybe for a long time, I, I can expect to go to the, okay, uh, Aramaic. Thank you, Elder Fadi. I can now go to the book of Revelation, uh, anticipating to understand it more from a very positive uh, uh, stance of getting to understand who is being revealed in, the, in, in that particular book. So it, it, it's quite an interesting entanglement to say what, to, just to understand what is the key message when we are looking at the book of Daniel through chiasm. And you know, remember there are preachers who try to reorganize those chapters to say chapter seven must come before chapter six. Then it becomes very problematic uh, from what we've heard today. Uh, there are a number of preachers who try to say, you know, in terms of sequence, this chapter seven should have been chapter six and chapter six should have been chapter seven. And imagine how much we are going to lose by that kind of, a, of an arrangement. And this is something that we need to watch for because human beings are in this business of rearranging things. So we just need to take it, say, you know, the Bible is perfect as it is and it does not need no addition, does not need no subtraction. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Elder, Elder, Elder G for that. Uh, because really we, we, we are in the habit of fixing things that are not broken. I, I really appreciate that. Uh, Uncle Da, I see you showing your face. Is it because you, uh, you, uh, you have a burning response? Oh, okay, all right, all right. Um, okay, all right. Uh, Uncle, is that Uncle Nyasham Gura? Uh, yes, oh, that's okay. me. We welcome, we welcome you. We welcome you to, um, to your part Thank of the you. world even though you're in cold <laughs> Canada. What is the temperature today? Oh, maximum is uh, projected to be minus 18, I think. Minus 18 okay. Celsius. Maximum. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. Speak, speak yeah. though with fire as if it's minus 18. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, actually Eldon Hamoy has touched on now what I was going to say as well. And um, when we look at uh, the, the book of Daniel, Okay, if the whole Bible is about one central character, Christ, and we also know the concept that you know the, we have many the characters, there are many characters in the Bible that are that we call a type of Christ. That in other words, they experience their lives, they exhibit a certain aspect of Christ's character. So, in the book of Daniel, the central theme, as Uncle Dyer said, is that ultimately. It's about the redemption and also about the Messiah. And the Messiah also coming through uh, chapter nine, which is also contains a certain uh, specific prophecy to the Hebrews, which is uh, the seventh week prophecy. And uh, that pertains to the Hebrews because they were granted that uh, period of probation. But ultimately the Messiah was going to come through the nation of Israel, was going to be a universal a redeemer for the whole world. 
So, and when you look at uh, the three Hebrew boys and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Daniel himself in the lion's den, he's also a type of Christ, okay? He was put into the grave, so to speak, and he was, uh, he was resurrected, so to speak. When you look at Cyrus, actually the, the Bible also says that Cyrus is God's servant. And uh, he is one who rescues the, the, what's it, the uh, and sets the Hebrews, give them permission to go back to the promised land. So he was in a, in a way a type of Christ, okay? Uh, who, is, who is coming to redeem the human race from captivity of uh, sin and also from the bondage of Satan with the prince of this world and to restore us back to uh, the heavenly Can uh, Canaan. So if you, if anything, when we started the book of uh, the, book, the, the, the prophecies, um, we should now do that with a, a, a keen eye to look for Jesus and what he's done, what he's doing and what he promises to do. And uh, when we jump to Revelation, book of Revelation, it starts off by saying, this is the revelation of Christ. So among the beasts, among all the, uh, the warnings of uh, the mark of the beast and among uh, the, the destruction, okay, and all of uh, Babylon. And, uh, and also even in the midst of uh, the seven last plagues, we are going to see this, those things, they must all work together in concert to reveal the man Jesus. So it really brings a different uh, complexion as it were to our study of the Bible because we are no longer now focused on the symbols but now really looking at uh, the man Jesus himself. And as he comes out more clearly, then as we look at him, we are also going to be changed into his likeness. Wow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Elder Nyasha. And I like, I like the, the message. I mean, as he was talking about the languages, because you know how God communicates in a way that we should be able to understand him. And that is why even as we understand what the tongues are in the book of Acts, we believe very strongly that it's a language because God, when he communicates, he wants us to understand. And this understanding is for the purpose of salvation because I, I think for me, one of my aha moments today was like the, 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 these, these, these chiasms in, in the two different languages and talking to both the Gentile and the Jew as it is a common theme throughout the Bible. I also like the, the comments that we see here. Uh, I saw Elder Tladi saying, Elder Namo, that's a cool way of accepting that the Bible structure was not by coincidence. And then and Ziki says to us, guys, the Bible is no ordinary book. And then there's an amen from Nomda. I don't, I don't know what went on before. Let me give over to you, Nomda. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank, thank you so much, um, Tesla Church, again, for hosting this. Um, thank you, Da, um, again, for that chaotic uh, structure. And Wuhle, too. Um, I think, Wuhle, the next time you go for your hike now, you will not just be looking forward to the apex. You will also be thinking about your way down. Thank you so much. So I, for me, um, what really is resonating um, with me is you know how Christ says uh, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me um, I tend to be a, a literal person so if he says that I'm like okay what does he mean by that but with this chiasm even where because I think we the one of the, the of the principles that we had established in the previous chapters is that as we study scriptures, Christ needs to be at the center. It doesn't matter how gory some of the stories are. Um, they could be bringing out contrasts, um, like how the bad behavior of the, you know, the children of Israel or the surrounding nations, and then you, look, you contrast that with the character of Christ. So in that, in that chiastic structure where you had the double um, chiasm, where you had um, one king, I mean, bad king who was humbled and then he repented, that was Nebuchadnezzar. And then uh, Belshazzar, who um, was also humbled, but, you know, did not repent. Um, that when we contrast with the life of Christ is that he too was humbled, um, but he humbled himself 
uh, to the point of death and death on the cross, that we can, we can learn so much about the love of God, even in those lives that don't look pretty and neat. And I think even when Uta was sharing the part here uh, of Adam and Eve, because I think in that story, according to the summary he had, there was, it didn't look like there was any redemption, but we know in the middle of that story and that mess, this is where we are promised of the Messiah in um, Genesis 3.15, that God would put enmity between uh, the woman and the seed and, um, the, and then the serpent, um, sorry, yeah, yeah. So in the end, you know, it's like God is victorious. We have hope no matter how um, hopeless our situations might appear. So thank you again, um, guys, for hosting this. We're learning so much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, Nomda. Madiba, I don't want to miss you because uh, you had said there's something you are uh, you're seeing, uh, but you didn't want to perhaps be seeing a new light. But I think one of the things that I had said as we do this Bible study is that all of us, as we continue to study, we are going to be uh, perhaps finding things that others have not necessarily have uh, others have not seen or have not become apparent, but we're learning from, from one another. Over to you, Madiba, the, because you were saying that you even had excitement. You used the word excitement. I don't want to get too excited. Over to you, okay. Teduma. Okay. Let me make this point. I was looking for this quotation by Ellen White, and I think it's in early writings where she says, cheap enough, cheap enough, help then is cheap enough. It was after Ellen White saw how God was operating and uh, how God was making it easy for us as sinners by all means to go to heaven. Now, I, and what comes to my mind, there's a cost, there's a, there's a certification that we do in the engineering field, it's called government ticket. When you're an engineer with government ticket, you that is the one of the highest things you can do. You get, there are 52 chapters that you must study and they test you on eight chapters. It's both electrical and mechanical. Very difficult, very few people pass that. And then the challenge with that course is that the lecturers are unpredictable. They are, you can study, uh, you can start, I've done it, doing all 2015 to 2020 question papers. It's very difficult to pick them. And when I look into God, how consistent, how chaotic it, whatever you can come that God is trying to make it, he's a best judge for us. He will want us to pass this exam to make it to heaven, how it deals, how it gracious is, how loving, how consistent it is. And I'm saying, you know what? I'm so excited. We serve a God who is very consistent, who deals with us as human beings with all these lessons and if you want to make it to heaven, given all this information and all these patterns and tools that we have, I think God is trying to show us that I love you and I want you to make it to heaven. You don't have to be rebellious. If you are rebellious and you repent, this is how I'm operating. Hence, I am very excited. That's just my summer of this excitement, which is still in you. And I'm still going to study it deeper because really it makes us realize that we serve a God. You know, I hate those lecturers who are very tricky on exam, who try to make us fail, not because we don't know, just because we couldn't understand the language or we're under pressure or under time. That's my comment. And God is love. Amen. Thank you so much, Matiba. That's, that's, that's really beautiful uh, because the, the idea behind uh, how God teaches us teaches really that for us to succeed. Uh, I see these comments uh, where uh, Elder Namo had spoken about, there's also power in repetition, eh? because I think as you see the mirror image, this was said, it's said again, so that you get it. Uh, you know how Christ would say, I say it again, so that you know when, I, when it happens that I told you. And oh, sometimes as you read, you would see that, you know, there's, there's this repetition for, for us to really get it. And the kind of lecturers, as Madiba was talking about, those lecturers who are unkind would say, guys, this will come up in the exam. 
pay attention to this, you know? So it's as if God is that kind of teacher, is that kind of professor who wants to make sure that we make it. And then uh, Elder Tladi in the comments said, yes, we have 100% repetition reaffirms the message and allows for deeper understanding of prophecy. And uh, amen and hallelujah from Zianda and Nziki. Wow, God is not a sadistic professor. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, I see uh, Uncle Da. Can, you can see that you are a good teacher. No, but before I go to Uncle Da, let me let me give to uh, uh, Elder C comments. No, thank you so much. Um, this is such a blessing, and the comments that have come through really uplifting. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say, I think it's next next time you hear my story, and I start from when I was in high school, then I move on to my uh, childhood and I jump on to my time as a parent. I think you can understand why things are kind of jumbled up. It's chiasm. Um, I mean, when you read the Bible, there is no chronology generally. And I think that's a point that's been picked up. But I wanted to, I just want to say chiasm and you mix with the concept of cyclic, uh, the cyclic nature of the telling of the Bible, Bible stories. What I then get is just to add to what oh, you know, the previous speaker just said, God is a, um, he wants us to pass this exam. The Bible is short. There isn't much in the Bible. The syllabus is not too long. It's the same concepts, um, lessons that keep repeating, you know, you start off with one here, it's there at the end. Then you've got another one, it's repeated. And then you add psych cyclic nature of it. So the same, uh, I mean, um, group of components that are in one chiastic, chiastic structure, you find them being uh, cyclic again within the Bible. And that to me just makes the Bible um, not too difficult to go through. So I just wanted to make this comment to say, just to, 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 to to, to emphasize the point that's been made, that God wants us to, to pass, but at, at the same time, he wants us to understand the Bible. I think for me, this chiasm um, coupled with the cyclic nature of storytelling just makes the entire Bible very easy to, to read because I'm repeating and I'm understanding and it's further emphasized elsewhere in a different way, but it's the same concept. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. It's funny, I'm looking at the list of the names. Right enough, Zoom uh, arranges names in alphabetical order, but the host is usually the one at the top. So it's as if there's a chiasm and the people at the center, Anyasha and Panda. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's, let's, let's go to, um, uh, to Uncle Da. Da, over to you. Uh, thank you. No, I love the um, analogy of the test. And just to add to that, I think that if you look at what we're going to be studying in the book of Revelation, is that it's, we know that we're going to be tested. And what we also know is that it's not going, it's going to be a multiple choice. So you're not going to be expected to come up with your own answers or anything, but it's a multiple choice with two options, A or B. And then God even tells us that if you choose, let's say A is choosing Satan, that if you choose Satan, the result will be such and such. And then B is choosing God. If you choose me, the result will be eternal life. So throughout the test that we'll be reading about in Revelation, that in our time, they may come A, B, C, D happening. We know the answer already and we know the conclusion. So it's a test where we are told that the, the result that I want you to choose is B. And then if you choose B, you will get eternal life. So how much easier can it get beyond that? So just an addition. Uh, thank you so much. Just to go to, to the comments as well. I like it when there's also repentance from the, from the participants. Uh, uh, as we know, Elder Namo is a, is, a, is a professor, is a teacher, is a lecturer is who, hide, who hide answers. I'm falling off my table. Why? I used to be like that, but I repented. We thank the Lord for the repentance of this uh, Christian teacher who's not, not aiming to fail the students. And Ziggy laughs at that and say, praise God for your repentance, Elder. 
And then Zianda says the, the America Canadian system wants you to pass and not fail. I mean, Prof Namo. And uh, yeah, so uh, I, I don't know. I, I still, there's an opportunity. We normally have this for 90 minutes, but if uh, people want to have had all of the, uh, we don't want to close out anyone. If people have had their comments, that's fine, or questions. I saw a hand, but it went down again. Nomda, did you want to say something? No. Oh, okay. All right. I thought it was it was a hand. Uh, I know Nziki is on the road, uh, but we have seen your 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 beautiful contribution, Smoo. It's good to see you, Smoo Kabela, and uh, Elder Tladi. When you didn't have electricity, we didn't hear your voice. You rested your voice, so let's hear you say something. <laughs> no, today I'm just blessed, my elder. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I joined a bit late. Um, I was, yeah, I was, I was at the uh, main Miller, just seeing oh. them there. Um, oh, yeah, but I think if I may, just uh, also, just say it's it's a blessing to for me personally to learn a new way of studying. It mm -hmm. just I think um, is enriching one's way of looking at Bible study, and. Yeah, I'm just looking forward to just applying it, um, learning the rest of the Bible. So that's what I'm really appreciative of. This, this new way is, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's refreshing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Elder T. I think I, I, I also like that, the idea of really, because I mean, I've had many at times people saying, put Christ at the center or whatever as you, as you study. Uh, but there's sometimes when you do not see the name of Christ or the name of God, particularly, then you kind of, you have a struggle as thing that the Bible we studied, I'm sorry, the, the, the book of the Bible we studied last time was the book of Esther. And yet you're like, wow, once you have this lens, you use this lens of looking at scripture, then those things just, just jump at you and you are able uh, to, to pick them up. Before I, I, I hand over to, to Da, I don't know, Chris. Any anything that you would like to say was well, not spoken, uh, or anybody else? And then we'll hand over to Da. He's going to tell us now because he said at around this time we were going. He was going to now start giving us homework because we are going to study the Book of Revelation, and it's going to be great to now use this lens. Okay, I see. I see the Canadians. Hey, the, um, Zianda, and then Yasha. Um, thank you, Nomda. Just a, a short comment. I had wanted uh, Seshi to perform La Ombi uh, to hear what he thought of it. I'm seeing he's our guest for the well. I'm seeing him for the first time. No, don't don't put my friend on the spot. He's observing for today. <laughs> okay, Nyasha, over to you. Thanks, Auntie. Yeah, I just want to add on to the point mentioned by Uncle Da about uh, the two choices, A or B. And uh, to say this, the plan of redemption, the offer of salvation, is essentially what God okay, planned and what he has done through the person of Christ, what he's doing right now and what is what is promised to do in the future. And for us right now, as long as we are alive, there's what I call the call to action. Because once you come to an understanding, okay, about a certain aspect of Christ and his character and what he's doing, then there is a call to action in this, and it is, what are you going to do about it? What is your response? Because, and that is what uh, now provides the evidence whether you have, you have selected A or B, because then our response to what God is doing, what Christ is and what he's doing and what he promises to do really is what you call the subjective aspect of our salvation. And this is our call to action. We must always ask ourselves, now that I have, understood this truth or God has revealed uh, this light, the light bulb has gone on in my mind. What am I going to do about it? Because just merely knowing is not enough because we, the truth, once we come to it, it must act on us. And uh, because if it doesn't, 
then we're going to lose out even with uh, what is full of knowledge. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, let, let me, let, let, let me give to uh, Elder Namo. Uh, uh, um, two things, um, I may not have the chance to thank Angota for the lessons um, on behalf of Testa. I know a viewer is, 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 your, is your family member, so really she can't thank you um, uh, and she should not. Uh, let me do that, Angota, and also Sister Zianda. Um, I, I think personally I've enjoyed going through these lessons. Um, I'm, 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 I'm really looking forward to, to engaging next year uh, in terms of this. <clears throat> and I think the other point that I, 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 I'm going to request Angota, uh, um, uh, I'm not a social media person, but I think at times it helps. If maybe we can have a clip uh, maybe of two, um, two of my highlights, I think it was the chiasm from the book of Esther. Uh, and also this one from the book of Daniel, so that you can help them as an advert to, to, because I think next year we want to recruit, want to recruit more participants across uh, the board, uh, not from TESTA. Um, I, I see my brother there, Madiba is there, he's, he's our, he, was our, he is our member. I don't know why he's attending where he attends, but he's our member effectively. Uh, I've seen uh, other people that we don't worship with. So if you can do a clip, uh, it might be a slideshow or whatever, maybe one minute clip, like a TikTok type for those uh, two chiasms, uh, um, uh, the one from Daniel and Esther, so that when you're, at, uh, when you're inviting people, we can actually have those clips on our social media platform. I don't have a platform, but I think those that have, they can do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. But at least you're on WhatsApp. So Elder, at least you, you are somewhere. We are we're glad that you're there. All right, I think that's a that's a that's a wonderful idea. Uh, almost like a little advert to invite others. Butle, I know you spoke when we started. I don't know if you, but uh, it's it, we we have four minutes now before the end of our Bible study. So let me hand over to our teacher, Uncle Da, to give us like if we need to do homework, we'll be going to be away for three weeks. And uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you to Tesla Church for giving us this opportunity to come and study together. So we appreciate it because I think we all grow by studying together. Um, as far as making a clip, I, I don't know how to get onto TikTok, so I wouldn't know how to do it. So if someone has the knowledge of how it's done, um, please let me know so that we can then work on it. But I have no idea how to do that. And then just to talk about what is coming in Revelation. So the challenge that we're going to have is how to make our study of Revelation not last 10 years, because there's just so much to study and to go into detail about. So we'll probably end up just uh, not doing a verse by verse study, but just sort of like studying in sections. And then I think once we've gone over the whole book and got the main concepts, there's always that opportunity to then go back and then start putting more meat into all the different things that we got from previously. So our first study is going to be about the, and the overall structure of the book of Revelation and how it is structured um, in the same form as the sanctuary and the sanctuary service. Because without that understanding, we will never get the proper understanding of the book. So those who want to read ahead, you can just go over the sanctuary service, the Day of Atonement and everything that happened, the Goat of Azazel, and then also just look in Revelation and just see how it's structured like the sanctuary. And then when we get together, we can then um, go over all of that. So that's what we'll be doing for January, come January. So thank you and have a good holiday to everyone. God bless. All right. Thank you so much. Elder Namo, I know you've written something in the chat, but I think you were clarifying that uh, you, were, you were saying TikTok, using TikTok as an example because of the brevity of the TikTok videos. So it doesn't have to be, it can be a WhatsApp video, something that's portable, a short advert. I think that's what yes. you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Elder? 
Yes, to speak. yes, yes. Remember the English, some of it fell in the sea. So. <laughs> we love TikTok. <laughs> Let them... <laughs> Uh, I like what Ziki wrote there that uh, the 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 lies, deception, and instilling of fear. Uh, these are at the foundation of Satan's strategy. It's interesting. In the morning, we read on fear as well, and God is undoing this through His Word because the idea is that God is this ugly God who wants us afraid of Him, afraid of anything that has to do with Him and not embrace the love that God has for us. All right, beautiful people, I want to thank you. Um, are you in, uh, Elder Elder Tladi, I'm going to ask you to give us the closing prayer. And again, I would really like to thank ev everyone for participating. It's been wonderful. Um, I think this foundation has made us all look forward to studying the book of Revelation, a book that has been really um, neglected or when approached, you really need to memorize certain things. But now we've seen that there's a pattern that's easy for us to understand. Okay, I'm going to hand over to you now, Elder Tladi, to give us the closing prayer. And again, I thank you, all of you, dear beautiful people, for joining us and see you on the 18th. It's the, no, it's not the 18th, is it the 15th that January most probably I will not be here that Sabbath afternoon. Uh, yeah, the Sabbath of the 15th. That's when we get back. But uh, given that also I'm not going to be elder, I think uh, perhaps the elders will decide who's going to facilitate the Bible study. Uh, but, I'll, but I'll be a very active member of this group. And thank you again to everybody. Over to you, Elder Kladi, as you give us the closing prayer. No, thank Before Elder Tlati speaks, I just want to say yes, to sir. all of you out in this, Happy Christmas and Merry New Year. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bujwam. Happy Christmas to you too. Uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege of prayer. And we thank you again for the privilege that we've had to have come together uh, for this Bible study and which is a great blessing, not only for us, but for those who will also receive this blessing through us as we share these messages with them. Uh, we pray that you continue to be the Elder Dewa, uh, continue to bless him and to counsel and guide him as he continues to share these messages that you have blessed him with. And just like the William Millers of old, may he continue to hold on to the faith and know that he's being led by you and that these are the messages that you want him to present to your children. And may we also, dear God, continue to be inspired to attend and to invite more uh, people to attend so they can also be blessed with uh, these Bible studies. Be with us as we uh, go our separate ways and enjoy uh, the holidays with families and friends, that dear God, uh, we may continue to seek and search your word. We pray for all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so may will be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elder Tladi. Amen. And Elder Tladi is the dad of two boys. That person yes, kept so. <laughs> <laughs> Those boys are not baptized. And those boys, I could feel, they're not baptized. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dallas, you want to baptize my two year old? <laughs> yeah, I could, yeah, I could feel that they're not acquainted with the spirit, but the father is in the spirit. <laughs> no, no, you see, when they say papa, they want the a share of that blessing, they don't want you to leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very much, it's been a blessing. Thank you. So right. this was my fellow, my fellow classmate that, that was with me today. <laughs> okay. Say that again. No, I was saying this was my classmate that was with me today. So he behaved for most of the time. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, yeah, he's done very well. Yes. All right, beautiful people. Thank you. Thank you. And enjoy. We're going to miss you. Hey, Nziki. Uh, are you still driving, my friend? I didn't want to be say, uh, say, say something. Uh, so that you, I force you to multitask. <laughs> I have arrived. I have arrived. <laughs>
<laughs> That's awesome. Beautiful. Thank you so much for your Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thanks, thanks, Bushle. I'm I'm going to call you uh, at some point. Uh, yeah, I owe you a call, bye. you and Lolo. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye.